welcome everyone uh, to this uh, session of the keynote speaker and uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Elaine Ostrander. She's the chief and distinguished investigator of the Cancer Genetics and Comparative Genomics Branch at the National Human Genome Research Institute of the National Institutes of Health. Uh, she got her PhD from Oregon Health Science University and a postdoc at uh, Harvard and Berkeley, and initiated the work with the dog genome in 1993. She has several achievements in reporting dog genes and its use as a model for understanding human health, and over 375 papers and many awards, such as the Burroughs Welcome Award for Functional Genomics, as a Maze Award, Canine Lifetime Achievement Award, NHGRI Membership Award, 2013 Genetic Society of America Medal, She's a fellow of the American Association for Advancement of Science, and since 2019, a member of the National Academy of Science. So welcome, Elaine, and please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you very much to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share with you the work that an amazingly talented group of trainees together with some very generous colleagues and I have been doing over the last couple of years to understand some new aspects in dog genetics. I've changed my title. I was originally gonna talk some about behavior, um, but instead I decided to in include some vignettes about aging. Um, and I think that'll generate some interesting discussion. So if you haven't heard me talk before, um, you haven't seen a slide like this, but I use it to remind everyone that dog breeds display uh, a very large diversity of morphologic traits, behavioral traits, and disease susceptibilities. And I think the more from studies of people all over the world is that the same genes that are responsible for human traits um, contribute to the comparable dog traits and, and the reverse is true as well. Those genes um, responsible for particular dog traits contribute to human health and biology as well. Now, while there's tremendous range of phenotypic... Excuse me, Elaine? Yeah? Uh, have you started your slides? Yeah. No, it's not showing. Uh, um, share a screen, we'll give it another whirl. You see him now? Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm going to go ahead and, and I'm going to go ahead and um, give it another quick start. Um, so thank you to the organizers for giving me this chance to um, share with all of you the work that um, some very talented trainees and some very generous collaborators um, together with myself have been doing over the last couple of years. I was originally going to include a module on behavior, but instead I've decided to include aging, um, which I, I think will generate some fun and interesting controversy. So dogs display a large diversity of morphologic behavioral traits, as well as disease susceptibilities. I like this as an example of diversity in morphology. And of course, over here, we have my border collie herding some sheep, a nice illustration of behavior. Um, down here, we have um, some cancer, melanoma. Um, and, and I think overall, these make the point, which has been shown by researchers the world over, that um, genes which control particular traits in dogs turn out to be important in human health and biology as well. And the reverse is also true. Things that we identify from studies in humans often turn out to be important um, in canine health and biology as well. Now, while there's a tremendous range of phenotypic diversity um, in the domestic dog, there's actually very little diversity within each breed. Now that's not only true for phenotype, but it's also true for genotype. And, and this slide nicely illustrates that. Between breeds, of course, there's a lot of diversity and the same can be said of the genomes as well. So just a couple things to keep in mind as, as we go through the 45 minutes. 
Um, all domestic dogs are members of the same species, Canis lupus familiaris. Um, and I know that's, that's sort of hard to think about when we think about the diversity in morphology, but indeed it's very much true. My own lab is in a long-term partnership with dog owners, breeders, lovers, veterinarians. We don't do any experiments in dogs. We don't keep any dogs in kennels. We don't breed dogs. We don't tell owners how they should breed their dogs. Ours is really a long-term partnership with owners like many of you. And that's where we get all of our samples hey, from. I'm sorry again, but uh, are you in full screen mode or just presenters mode? Presenter mode, do you want me to switch? To, yeah, to, to, foot, to slide view for, for, for the whole screen, no? Yeah. Okay. okay, can you see it now? Yes, please. All right. Um, so I had been saying that all domestic dog breeds are members of the same species and that my own lab um, doesn't kennel or keep any dogs or do experiments on dogs. All the DNA samples we get are through our partnership with dog owners like yourselves. And finally, um, there are bottlenecks that have occurred during domestication and during breed formation. So small numbers of alleles um, have passed um, through the hourglass in that process of domestication and breed formation as well. Um, and so as a result, we see fixation of alleles and the associated traits. And we'll use that to our advantage as we go through um, some of these mapping studies. So um, there are other people on the podium that can much better address how and when modern breeds were created. But I guess I get asked that question all the time. Um, so I'll just say briefly that dogs originated in the old world, that they're sister to the Eurasian gray wolf. Um, modern dogs are from an ancient and a now extinct lineage. Um, they're the only large carnivore to be domesticated. And although there's some debate as to when, you know, the range is somewhere between 15 and about 30,000 years ago. So evolutionarily, this is just a tiny, tiny drop in the bucket. And you may not realize that most breeds were created during the Victorian age. And so, you know, we're just talking about a couple hundred years. So that is a gazillionth of an evolutionary drop in the bucket. Um, and so those things play very strongly into the approaches that we use um, for identifying genes that are responsible for the various traits we're interested in. Now I'll be showing you um, studies that involve data from either SNP chips, single nucleotide polymorphism chips, as well as whole genome sequence. Um, and I'll try and identify which is which as we go through. Um, people in my lab are interested in lots of different things. We study morphology and body size um, and ancient alleles, and I'll go through some of that work um, with you today. We've been very interested for a long time in breed organization. So what breeds were related to which other breeds and how were various um, uh, and different breeds formed. And unfortunately, I won't have time to go through that work today, but it's always fun to, to talk about. Um, we studied the genetics of cancer susceptibility. This is a Bernese mountain dog. 25% of members of that breed will get histiocytic sarcoma and all will die of the disease. So we won't be talking about that today, but on chromosome 11 is an example of one of the, uh, one of the loci that we've identified that increases susceptibility to that disease in this breed, important for both human and canine health. Um, Dog 10K is an international consortium, which is sequencing several thousand canine genomes. Um, the first couple have a uh, couple thousand um, are becoming available now. I will talk about aging um, and the methylome and those collaborations, um, but I won't be able to talk about the dogs of Chernobyl. So this is Gabby Spatola. She's a graduate student in my lab um, and she's here in Chernobyl collecting DNA samples from dogs that live in the reactor and around the reactor, trying to figure out what is the underlying genetics that have allowed dogs um, to exist in this very hostile environment um, for such a long time. So we'll, we'll save some of this for, for or later. So we'll start with morphology. Um, the, the reoccurring theme here today is that there are small numbers of genes um, that control very large effects. Um, and, and that's probably nowhere you know, more obvious than when we think about body size. So we've identified lots of genes for, for body size, skull shape, leg length, coat color. 
And then all things related to fur, texture, length, growth pattern, um, and for at least 50% of the audience, um, loss of fur or loss of hair. So um, I'm going to focus on two studies um, that were done by then postdoc in my lab, Joss Blasse, um, that deal with the issues of weight and height across domestic dog breeds. Now, when Joss joined my lab, he said, you know, that's fine that everyone's been looking at one trait, one trait, one trait, one trait. I don't want to do that. I want to look at a whole bunch of traits at the same time. And so that's exactly what he set up to do by putting together a data set of 722 whole genome sequences from a variety of canids. And while we did some of the sequencing, um, a, a lot was also contributed by other members of the community. So his final data set had 538 domestic dogs representing 144 breeds, as well as 54 wild canids and 104 village dogs. So village dogs are, are those individuals that live, you know, kind of on the outskirts of the town, often near the garbage dumps. They're not true wild dogs, but you wouldn't really invite them, um, you know, into your home to snuggle up with your, your kids for the night. So um, he identified 91 million variants. And just like we saw in the human ENCODE project, um, only about 1% of those um, are in exons and the rest are distributed in various non-coding um, regions. So he did GWAS uh, studies using lots and lots of different traits. And some examples are shown for you here on this slide. Um, so furnishings, the presence or absence of the mustache and eyebrows versus the so-called clean shaven look of the miniature pincher gives us this huge signal um, on r spondin 2 which is a gene important in follicle development. If you haven't looked at these before, this is a Manhattan plot and the different colors indicate the dog's 38 chromosomes as well as the X. Um, the y-axis um, is a measure of significance given is minus the log of the p-value. Um, and the significant Bonferroni line is indicated by the red dashed lines. Um, we also looked at fur length and it got uh, hit exactly where we had seen it before at FGF5, 10 to the negative 19th. So these are, are really serve as some nice positive controls for what we've seen before. Now, when we think about things like standard read height and standard read weight, though, the story gets much more complicated. These are not single gene traits. These are both multi-gene traits. So a couple things really um, stand out. Um, the first is that some of the same genes are responsible for both, like IGF-1, HMGA-2, SMAD-2, and L4L. Um, the second thing that's really quite striking is there's a lot of these that we actually knew about from studies of um, human body size. So certainly HMGA2 was a biggie, growth hormone receptor was a biggie, um, SMAD2 was one that we've learned about recently in, in human studies, as well as some on the, on the X. So all told, we've identified about 20 genes that explain most of the variance in body size um, in the dog breeds that we've studied thus far. So that's so different than what you would see if you were looking at humans. You do the same experiment in humans, you want to find genes that control the difference between being five foot six and six foot six, you would be identifying hundreds of GWAS loci, literally hundreds. And it, it sort of makes sense, right? Because humans have been around for millions of years. So lots and lots of time to chisel away at the genome. Um, lots of small things contributing a little bit. Dogs have been around for a very short period of time. You have to hit, you have to hit hard. You only have a few opportunities. So we see small numbers of loci of large effect in dogs. And this is true for any morphologic trait. We map lots of them. And large numbers of loci of small effect um, when we look in humans. Now, there are um, two genes that are particularly important in canine body size, LCOR-L and IGF-1, which together make up about 28% of the variance. And one of these I want to talk about in, in a fair amount of detail, um, and that's IGF-1. 
So IGF-1 is a biggie. It's the first one we found in 2007. Um, and it's shown up in every single GWAS that anyone has ever done of body size, mass, or skeletal size in domestic dogs. This was our very first result. And here, Nate Sutter, postdoc in the lab then, was just comparing large versus small Portuguese water dogs. Um, and he got this great big hit. So I wanted to next um, show you the uh, sort of a, one of those typical pathway slides with hitting where every, all the different places where IGF-1 interacts. And so I Googled IGF-1, expecting all those pathway slides to come up. Um, but instead, what I learned is that IGF-1 plays a major role if you want to improve yourself in the gym in terms of your bodybuilding or your weightlifting. Um, and so you can buy um, antler spray because it turns out the highest natural concentration of IGF-1, as I learned, um, are in the velvets of antlers. And so you have um, lots of opportunities to do that if you go to somewhere like esupplements.com, um, but don't tell them um, that I sent you. So looking a little further, of course, I found lots of those kinds of, of slides. Um, and this is really an outline slide, just telling you all the different places um, that, that IGF-1 um, interacts, all these different pathways. Its primary role is mediated by binding to the IGF-1 receptor, um, which is present on the surface of many cell types and in many tissues. And it also plays a, a key role in, in tumor genesis. So anyone who's been doing studies in cancer um, will certainly see IGF-1 pop up quite a bit. Not sure what happens. Hmm. All right. Um, so this slide shows you um, some work again um, that Joss did. And so Joss really went after figuring out what the underlying mutation was. This is something we'd had no luck with before. Lots of things have been proposed, this microsatellite, this SNP. We'd never been able to, to validate that. Nobody else had either. And so Joss really dug in deep onto this question. He analyzed 1,436 dogs, wild canids, and ancient genomes um, and he identified a long non-coding antisense, which is shown for you in here, um, that interacts with IGF-1 mRNA, and IGF-1 is shown for you here in blue. So the SNP is located in the last exon of a predicted 1204 base pair long non-coding RNA. And there are two variants to keep track of. The C allele, which is very strongly associated with small size, and the T allele, which is very strongly associated with large size. Um, so there's a lot of data on this slide, but it's all giving you the same message about the, the strong association between genotype and body mass and the relationship between IGF-1 serum levels and, and body mass. So starting on the left, here are the three genotypes, CC, CT, and TT. Um, and here we're looking at body mass in kilograms, and you can see this very nice correlation, um, which is statistically significant. So then we got the great idea that, you know, we should look in miniature standard and giant schnauzers, and we should look in toy and miniature and standard poodles and see what happens. And so starting with the schnauzers, um, what we see is that almost everybody here in red is a homozygote for the small allele. And then standard schnauzer is about twice the size of the miniature schnauzer, and we start to see some heterozygotes in orange. Giant schnauzers are more than twice the size of a standard schnauzer, and everybody now is a homozygote for the large allele. Um, pretty much the same in toy poodles and miniature poodles. But when we look at standard poodles, it's a little bit different. Standard poodles have been frequently crossed with miniature poodles in the development of a lot of lines, often to capture a particular coat color. And so in standard poodles, we see all three genotypes. Now over here, um, we're, we're also looking at IGF-1 serum level. So let's start in the middle where we have all three genotypes and bop up to the top and we can see that same correlation we saw before in body mass. And body mass, when we bop down to the bottom, we see a strong correlation with IGF-1 serum level. Um, again, strongly significant. Where we don't see as strong a correlation is when we look at genotype and IGF-1 serum level. And so that's telling us that it isn't 
just a simple story of genotype affecting expression levels. It's a more complicated story than that. Um, and now that um, Joss is back in France, he's focusing on the functional experiments. Um, and he won't mind me telling you that he has some good preliminary data um, suggesting um, that it's really translation where the um, action is taking place. But again, we'll save that for another day. So um, uh, next, we developed this wonderful collaboration um, with Gregor Larson um, and Laurent France, um, looking at ancient um, DNAs. So we're able to show that the antisense is associated with size in wolves and dogs, that both alleles have been segregating for at least 10,000 years before present in dogs, and as you'll see, 50,000 years um, before present in wolves. So we found um, three Israeli dogs, uh, about 23,000 year old, um, and they're estimated to weigh about 15 kilograms, and they all possess a small allele. And we also um, identified this pre-contact American dog from Newfoundland, it's about 4,000 years old, described as a, as a large dog, and that indicated here in yellow is homozygous for the large allele. So the antiquity of these alleles and their geographic distribution in ancient dogs suggests that each has been segregating in the ancestor of dogs probably for a very long time. So to better explore this hypothesis, we analyzed genome-wide data from nine ancient dogs um, and 68 um, modern gray wolves. And these came from different, lo uh, different locations, including nine different countries. So the analysis, and this is all collaboration with Gregor and Laurent, indicates that the IGF-1 variant that we've identified here segregates not only in dogs, but in both modern and in ancient wolves. And so wolves are here in triangle um, and dogs are the circles and orange you can see are the heterozygotes and up here are the homozygotes for the large allele. So that is not true of any other variant that's ever been proposed of um, as being the IGF-1 um, causative variant. So in essence, we observed the small allele indicated in red, um, albeit at a very low frequency in ancient wolves. Um, and we also identify it over here in a 53,000 year old Pleistocene Siberian wolf, which is a heterozygote. So this really demonstrates the antiquity of that small allele. It's really been around for a very long time. So although that large allele is more frequent in gray wolves, the antiquity of the small allele really gave us a conundrum in terms of figuring out which is ancestral, you know, the large or the small allele. So shown in the bottom panel, we analyzed 24 additional genomes from 11 distantly related canid species. And the different species are indicated for you here on the right, golden wolves, African hunting dogs. There were three types of jackals, Channel Island foxes, dole Ethiopian wolves, gray foxes, red wolves, um, and so on. And um, what we found um, when we look down here again, is that all of these are homozygous um, down here for the small allele. It's the gray wolves up here where we're seeing um, homozygosity for the large allele. And so what that's really telling us is that it's really the small allele that's in the ancestral state. It's really the small allele that's ancestral. So it, that's further supported in this evolutionary analysis over here, where we see ferret, panda, and cat all have um, the small allele. So our working hypothesis is, is, is really shown for you here, and there's sort of lots more work to do to, to really prove this. We think the Canada ancestor is likely small, and it carried the C allele. The large allele arose sometime before 53,000 years ago, and it generated these bigger animals. So the ancestral allele is segregating, as we saw in the previous slide, but at a very low rate. And then when domestication happens, you know, 20,000, 15,000 um, years ago, we start to see strong selection for a small allele. We're seeing these um, small dog breeds. Um, and we're also looking for large dog breeds uh, for protection and hunting. Um, and we see that they carry the large allele. 
And all these other canids that we looked at, the jackals, the doles, the foxes, everything on the previous slide, for the most part are homozygous for the small allele. It's really just the coyote that isn't, um, and I'll tell you why that's mixed um, in, in just a moment here on this slide. And so I think what this slide demonstrates best is that this whole story is not just a dog wolf thing. Um, it's actually a canid wide thing. So if you look on the top panel, we're looking at mean body mass for 79 different coyotes. And so it goes from large, which is this dark blue to small, which is this purple. I'm sorry, the color gradient isn't better. The number of individuals we looked at 10, 20 or 30 is given um, by the size of the circles. And when we look over here in the West, um, those coyotes are much smaller than the ones we're seeing over here in the East. And then we looked at the frequency of the C allele, again, that small allele. And we see that the small West Coast coyotes are primarily homozygous. And when we get to the East Coast, um, we're, seeing, we're seeing all three genotypes, um, uh, certainly including heterozygous. And these differences in size are small. West Coast coyotes on average weigh about nine kilograms, East Coast coyotes about 16 kilograms. And then when we look over here, this is some uh, samples that Bridget von Holt gave us. Um, and these, by the way, have been given to us um, by Bob Wayne. So here we analyzed 28 coyotes from uh, the state of Pennsylvania. And up here, you're looking at genotype. And as we said, you see all three different types. Um, and down here, we're looking at phenotype. And again, apologizing for the color coding, but the match here is really excellent and statistically significant. So, um, you know, why we're seeing this size difference isn't really known. A lot of people speculate it's because the East Coast coyotes have hybridized with gray wolves. We didn't really explore that any further. We're going to leave that for other people to think about. Um, but this was certainly really exciting. Now, having said um, all of that, um, we started to think more and more about this relationship between body size and, and longevity. And so the fact that small dogs, and this is weight in pounds, live much longer than large dogs has been known for a long time. This is a figure from a paper by Jones et al. in 2008. And in this end of the curve, you find the Shipper Key, the Pomeranian, the Toy Poodle, the Manchester Terrier. And when we look over here at the big dogs, the Dog de Bordeaux, the Leonberger, the St. Bernard, et cetera, um, we see that they live for much um, shorter periods of time, um, as little as eight years. Um, maybe the longest lived are about 12 years. So we wanted to explore dogs as a system for studies of aging and had a great opportunity to collaborate with Trey Eidegger on the first part of this study. So we know that all mammals progress through similar physiologic stages from very early development to puberty, aging, and eventually, of course, to, to death. And the extent to which this conserved physiology reflects underlying conserved genomic events um, is certainly something that's been controversial. So by way of definition, we'll talk about the methylome, which are patterns of epigenetic modifications. Methyl, methyl groups are present at some cytosine, guanine, dinucleotides, but they're not present at others. And the methylation states of tens of thousands of CPGs change predictably over time. And that's enabled the construction of mathematical models or epigenetic clocks that use these um, shifting patterns to measure age. So we wanted to know what the relevant CPG sites were, where they were located and how they correlated with dog aging. So Tina Wang um, did a, a wonderful analysis using some new methodology I, I'm not going to talk about. And she captured 50,000 canine CPGs um, in 105 Labrador retrievers. And those labs ranged in size from just a few months to 16 years of age at the point where the blood samples were collected. Um, they were um, enriched for regions within exons, transcription start sites, um, and CPG islands. So um, the first thing we observe is that the highest methylome similarities occur when we pair young dogs and humans and when we compare aged dogs and humans. So we're looking at dogs ranked youngest to oldest, humans ranked youngest to oldest, and it's really young dogs and humans and old dogs and humans where we see this tan color indicating the greatest methylome similarity um, as opposed um, to the rest of the data. 
This signal was sufficiently strong to arise in an unsupervised methylome-wide analysis without any subselection of markers. So that's telling us that conserved methylation changes extend to the greater mammalian genome. Now this contrasts with previous observations which did not find this strong relationship. But that's likely because those clocks for, for those um, earlier studies were done using human optimized sites and a very small number, probably 80 to, to 300. So we asked if conserved methylation changes show a constant rate of change with age in the dog. So this is driven by um, a question I kept hammering at Trey, which is everybody says that seven human years are one dog year. Um, is that true? That can't be true. We got to figure that out, Trey. What's going on with that, Trey? Um, and so indeed it is not true. We observed a monotonic time resolved but nonlinear relationship between dog and human age in these reciprocal analysis um, as evidenced by the, the similarity in these fitted functions. So when we combine the data from uh, those, those two results, we can actually come up with a single function that describes human versus dog age. You can take human age and it's gonna be 16 times the natural log of the dog age plus 31. Um, so if you have a, a dog and you wanna know how old it would be if it were human, you can use this. If you have a child um, who's maybe more challenging than you would have hoped, and you wanna know how old it would be if it was a dog, um, you can obviously use the same function. So what we really see is strong agreement between the approximate times at which dogs and humans experience common physiologic milestones. And so infant and then juvenile, adolescent, mature, um, going you know, all the way up here to, to senior, you see this really nice smooth curve. And so for instance, eight weeks in dogs, is nine months in humans. And, and it's fun to play around with that and think about your own family and your own dog. You might see if you're aging each other. So when we asked where the conserved changes are, we identified 394 genes for which methylation values showed conserved and time-dependent behavior across species. So we mapped them onto PCNET. It's a database of molecular interactions. And they clustered into these five um, network modules, anatomic development one and two, that obviously makes sense, two dealing uh, with neurologic development, synapse assembly and regulation, a neuroepithelial cell and differentiation. And then the fifth one was leukocyte differentiation and metabolic pathways. And that's a, a really big and complex and, and sort of gnarly one. So we used these, we, we wanted to see if we um, could developed um, conserved developmental gene models to construct an epigenetic clock that's capable of predicting age in multiple mammalian species, not just one. So we use those same 439 CPGs in one approach. And then we use the single species methylome, which is you know, 50,000 or so in the second approach. And you know, actual age in mouse years correlates well with mouse epigenetic age, dog years correlates well with dog epigenetic age. And the issue is what happens um, when you um, test on one species, you train on one species, and then you test on the other species. And what we're going to see um, is that the conserved development um, approach works much better than the single species approach. So let's look down here. Um, gray is the single species methylone. Um, teal is the conserved development approach. So we train on dog and we test on dog. Oh, they don't look too different. We train on mouse. We test on mouse. No, oh, they don't look too different. But look what happens when we train on dog and we test on mouse. Then we see a big difference with the conserved development working much better. Or if we train on mouse and we work on dog, again, the conserved development approach works much, much better. So with those results um, in hand, we began a second collation, collaboration, sorry, with Steve Horvath. And this is a much bigger data set. We provided 767 dog blood samples, and this time from 93 different breeds. We also provided 100 Portuguese water dogs to compare with the 100 labs, but that's still going on. And we had 1,300 um, human samples for comparison um, done differently. These were run on the Horvath mammal methyl chip.
And that profiles highly conserved cytosines across mammalian species. So of all of those, 39, uh, excuse me, 32,000 mapped to the canine reference genome. Um, and that switched from the boxer um, to the German Shepherd, where we have a great long read high C optical mapping dog reference genome um, that was provided by the Broad. And of course, is all that's publicly available. And so the data look good. Um, we have a great age distribution for when samples were collected, and we have essentially equal numbers of males and females. When we do a PCA analysis and we include X chromosome data, we get really good separation for males versus females, with this one exception here that I have to go back and look at. Um, when we throw out the X and we use um, only the autosomes, um, it's, it's kind of interesting. The, the different symbols indicate age. So zero to one are circles, triangles are one to two, squares two to five, and these crosses are five to 20. And you can see these aged dogs really pull out here. Um, in PC2 and obviously male versus female does not. So the two big questions, is epigenetic age an accurate predictor of chronological age and is it an accurate predictor of time to death? And the answer to both of those is, is yes. So looking over here on the left, we had a large data set, 742 breeds. And you can see we get this really nice line, complete intermixing of all the breeds. No one breed is driving the result. Um, and the R squared here looks great at 0 0.8. So epigenetic age can predict chronological age in individual um, dogs with very high fidelity. And then can it predict um, time to death? And again, um, the answer is yes, we get a nice line. Correlation here is 0 0.92. Um, and no one dog breed is, is strongly driving the result. So that's kind of remarkable when you think of it. A dog can come into the vet's office. Maybe it's a dog you're thinking of adopting from the pound. And you want to know his age. You want to know how long it's likely to live based on all this data from all these breeds. And you can get that predicted answer. Now, remember, um, this is mean data and this is predicted data. So if after this, your dog runs out in the street, it gets hit by a car, you know, there's nothing we can do um, about that. Um, this was based on age at which samples were collected. We don't have long-term outcomes um, for any of these dogs. So we did an epigenome-wide association study of um, breed characteristics. We looked at lifespan, weight, and height. Um, and you can see we get a, a number of um, interesting hits. I was interested in TCCA. That's actually um, the Bardet beetle gene. And I don't know why that would be here. It's a developmental disorder. Um, but clearly there's some interesting things here. In this case, um, the GWAS results for lifespan versus weight are driven by the extremes here. These are Z-scores for weight and Z-scores for lifespan. Um, and it's going to be um, the, the much smaller long-lived dogs and the much larger short-lived dogs um, that are um, allowing us to, to really stretch out and identify what these genes are. The magic number is 19. There are 19 genes um, that are shared by height and weight and lifespan. Um, and so we're just beginning to investigate these. Some of these are really tantalizing. Some of them complete uh, complete surprises. So we find that most CPGs that are associated with lifespan exhibit decreased methylation, whereas those associated with weight or height um, display increased methylation. So lots more um, fun work to do there. So in the last few minutes, um, oh, I did want to mention um, two fun ones, IRS1 and IGF1R, both in the insulin pathway. So yay, um, more things where we expect to find them. And again, these are responsible for human um, disorders when mutated in humans, diabetes, insulin resistance, um, and growth defects. So in the last five minutes, uh, I'm going to change gears. I was going to talk about behavior. But when I was reading the abstracts, I realized that there were a lot of people here that were really interested in conservation biology. Um, and so instead I decided to talk about the New Guinea singing dog study um, that we had done. Um, and this is work that we did together with Brian Davis um, and a number of other people who I'll mention as we go along. So New Guinea singing dogs are arguably the rarest breed in the world. There's estimated to be only two to 300 living today and they're in zoos, private rescues, conservation centers. 
etc. Um, they're about 12 to 20 inches tall, 20 to 40 pounds, have a short, dense coat, prick ears. Um, their appearance is really pretty commonplace, but their voice is not. didn't want to go back and, and, and do it again. Um, so they have this very um, rhythm. They have this very interesting um, um, sound that they make. They go up and down the register. Um, they have a lot of tone changes as they, as they go up and down the register. And that's very haunting. And it's also very unique. It's not something that we see in any other um, dog breed or, or any related species. So we asked where these, these captive dogs um, have, have come from, and, and we looked back at, at a lot of records, and we found that in 1956, a pair of living so-called mountain dingoes were captured, and they were sent to a zoologic park in, in Sydney, and that's where they got the name New Guinea singing dogs, from what you heard on the previous slide. Now, the female of that pair was pregnant, and her four puppies are the primary source of all New Guinea singing dogs in the United States. In 1976, another five live specimens were captured and sent to Germany, and that was actually the last capture and exportation of New Guinea singing dogs that's occurred ever. So those eight dogs are the ancestors of all captive New Guinea singing dogs, and allegedly they hadn't been observed in the wild since the 1970s. And that all changed in 2018 when a terrific field biologist, James McIntyre, went to Papua, Indonesia, um, searching for New Guinea singing dogs, um, and he identified three. And then our question was, are these really the original New Guinea singing dogs? So the samples were acquired um, from near the Freeport Gold Mine, um, which is the largest functioning gold mine um, in the world. Two males were caught in bait traps. They were sampled, tagged, and released, and they were also able to sample one recently deceased um, female. Samples were sent to NIH. We extracted DNA. We genotyped them with a 150,000 marker SNP chip, and we merged that data with data from 1,300 breed dogs as well as village dogs. And we talked about village dogs from China, from Vietnam, from Papua New Guinea, from French Polynesia, Fiji, Borneo, lots of different places. And then we asked, what's the closest genetic neighbor? And so you're looking at a neighbor joining dendrogram. Distances were calculated as the inverse of the identity by state at those 150,000 SNPs. And so over here, this little green triangle, those are our three Highland wild dogs. And you can see they end up in a clade with the captive New Guinea singing dogs here in red and the dingo. And everything else is separated down here. So that was fascinating to us. That's exactly where we would have hoped that they would have ended up. So the one thing we had to to really address that was a stinko issue because one could speculate uh, that our Highland wild dogs were actually some form of dingo. So um, lots of people gave us dingoes to look at. We had dingoes from Fraser Island, Alpine dingoes, um, desert dingoes, captive dingoes, wild dingoes. And then of course we still have our captive New Guinea singing dogs and our Highland wild dogs. And clearly um, those two are on a branch um, together and all the dingoes um, separate down here. By the way, this shade of green are um, dingoes and these three here are our um, Highland wild dogs, which we now know are New Guinea singing dogs. So that was incredibly exciting. These were in fact not extinct. Now, when we compare their genomes, we find that 28% of the Highland wild dog genome is not present in the captive dog populations. And that likely represents um, some ancient signal that's been lost in the breeding from these eight um, dogs that were captured in the 70s. May also represent some modern diversity, maybe some village dogs got in there once or twice, um, but we're in the process of, of figuring that out. Um, so here are our six chromosomes and we're looking for oceanic signatures, the dingo New Guinea sing dog, European dogs, Asians, um, Asian breed dogs, that's yellow. We don't see much of that. We see um, some European. Um, we see almost no Mediterranean or Nordic here in the, in the purple or in the pink. So one can go through this data and you can pick out the regions and you can pick out the genes and hopefully eventually figure out what's been under selection or what's been let go um, during this very interesting process.
So I'll stop there. Sorry for the glitches um, at the beginning there. Um, domestic dogs offer great opportunities to study the genetics of morphology, disease, and behavior. The traits that we've studied thus far are controlled by small numbers of genes of large effect, with the key alleles often being non-coding. These recently discovered Highland wild dogs are original New Guinea singing dogs, but we want to figure out what's going on more with their genome. Studies of the methylome and lifespan highlight the role of developmental genes in aging. Um, a dual species epigenetic clock predicts time of age and time to death of individual dogs. And through the International um, Dog 10K Consortium, whole genome sequence of 2000 new canine genomes has become available. So I'll stop there. Lots of collaborators. I can't highlight everyone. I'll mention Joss, postdoc in my lab, who did so much of the work. Um, Gregor and Laurent, who collaborated on the body size work, particularly the ancient work. Um, Trey and Tina, who did the first part of the methylone work. Steve, Aki, and Amin, um, who did the latter part. Uh, Bridget, the coyote work. And then Brian and Kylie Karens um, with the New Guinea singing dog work. So I'll stop there. And I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Thanks, Elaine. Very nice talk. Uh, we have some questions already. Um, All right, fire away. If uh, paleontologists found dog fossils, how many species would they propose? Um, so when they talked to Gregor and the Ron, <laughs> um, they would actually know a fair amount um, based on where it is and the depth that was found um, and all sorts of, of different factors, measurements, um, and things that, that they would identify from, from those fossils. So I don't have a singular number, um, maybe Gregor does, but we're not talking by any means about hundreds, you know, we're, we're talking really about pretty small numbers. I'm gonna guess, you know, depending on their age, most of them would probably be some form of wolf, gray wolf. Okay, this was a question for Robert Kahn, uh, from Robert Kahn. Uh, Jen Kwan Li, which significant threshold did you use for GWAS? Um, so, uh, you know, we calculate what's correct for each one, but generally 10 to the negative seven. The Bonferroni okay. correction, we did Bonferroni correction. Rakan Nabusi, uh, have you looked at the post translational modifications of IGF 1? And how could that affect its clearance time from serum? Yeah, so that's a great question. So Joss is doing, um, he's returned to France where he's from, and he's doing um, those, those things now, taking the lead on those things. Um, we, I don't think he knows the answer specifically to that. I, I know he's focused on translation and interacting proteins, um, things that he thinks play a role in, in binding at the critical regions. Um, so I think that's something that we're going to have to wait a little bit longer for. Okay, here's one from Brenda Opert. Uh, great talk. Is there anything you can do to modify methylation to lengthen lifespan? Oh, uh, wouldn't that be great um, so that dogs could live forever without having to, uh, to clone your dog? Um, obviously, I, I don't know of anything. I guess the best things we can do are to take good care of our dogs, exercise them, feed them, all those sorts of things that we, we know about. Okay. Uh, from Hugo James, does the aging model developed in dogs apply accurately to wild or non-artificial selection subjected species? So it, it does apply to um, artificially selected species because almost, uh, you know, most of those direct of uh, those dog breeds have been under human directed selection and, and it works really well um, across breeds. So the question of, of wild, we haven't applied it to partly because um, while we have DNA samples from a bunch of wild canids, we don't know the age of those individuals at which the samples are taken. So knowing the age at death doesn't matter for this kind of analysis. It, what really matters is how old was the methylome at the point where the samples were taken. Um, and so we need to start a deliberate new study working with a conservation center or a zoo, um, starting with young individuals where we sample them over time. And that, that'd be a fascinating question. 
Okay, one more. Uh, Delphine Fleury, which big dogs have shorter lifespan? Any hints from these 19 genes? Um, yeah, so um, the, the shortest lifespans are related somewhat to the diseases that the, the dogs get. So things like torsion or the twisting uh, of the intestines, that's a big problem in many breeds like Leonberger's. Um, I'm going to... Uh, I'm a little hesitant to stick my neck out there and say which of the very shortest lifespans um, in part because, um, yeah, I just don't know. That's in part why, you know, we know certainly St. Bernard's and Newfoundland's and Leanburgers and, and um, Great Danes who get a lot of cancer. Scottish Deerhounds get a lot of cancer. Um, those are all fairly short lived. The one that's sticking out in my mind are actually Scottish Deerhounds. Um, and Irish wolfhounds, but please don't quote me on that. And that relates to their high incidence of cancer. So that's sticking in my head, but, you know, don't quote me on that. Okay. Uh, one more. Gerald Bell, uh, has an, anyone looked at the methylum of clone dogs? Oh, isn't that a great question? I would love to do that, Gerald. And um, so, hi, Gerald. Um, and if you have access to any, please send them our way, um, because that is an absolutely fascinating question. I mean, we would want to know the age at which the samples used in the cloning were, were taken. Um, and it'd be great, um, as we said before, to be able to look over the lifespan uh, of the clone dog. So if you, you have a mechanism there, then we definitely need to talk, because that be a fascinating experiment. All right. Thank you everyone for your patience, especially with all of our little glitches at the beginning, which slowed us down a little. Um, I appreciate your time and attention. Okay. Thank you very much, Elaine.